I am Justin Gatlin. This is Ready, Set, Go. What's up, everybody? We back for another one. I appreciate everyone listening, all the supporters, all the haters. Keep listening, tune in, and let's get it. Ready, set, go. Hey, mom and dad, how y'all doing? We well, son. Good. Doing fine. Good, good, good. I just want to sit and talk a minute. You know, um, I think we never had a, a real opportunity to kind of go through my career as a whole and what we experienced together. Because, you know, everything was moving so fast all the time. It was one year championship, next year championship. We were running around the world. We're doing all kind of stuff like that. There were all the ups and downs and, excite- and excitement. We never had an opportunity to slow down and really talk about how we felt through different situations. And that's 20 years, 20, almost 20 years of just globe trotting, as, as my dad would say, globe trotting around the world. So let's get started. Let's start a little bit from the beginning. So I'm thinking the fact of upbringing, moved from New York, moved down to Pensacola, Florida, where we're at now. And I found sports. So how was it for you? Well, finding sports was fine for me. I felt like it was important for you to um, just try it all. Have fun, try it all. And whichever one worked for you, worked for us. Well, for me, I, I, I knew you had a little athleticism in you, you know, when we were living in New York and military housing. You know, when you lost two thumbnails, you were so tough. <laughs> on the monkey bars and running down Quentin Street and on your feet and beating everybody on bicycles and stuff. So I knew there was some athleticism in you, you know. Uh, but then, like Mom said, you know, we transferred with the military down here and and just took off. Okay. So playing basketball, baseball, swimming as well. Um, you both came to all my different events, right? Right, right. Well, we came to support you. I mean, that's what we do. We support you. We always felt like um, every every kid needed the support of their parent. And we were not going to have you participate in anything without being there to support you. But I remember when I brought home that jersey from Fair Pass Middle School <laughs> and I walked in the door. And I showed you the jersey. And you both looked at each other and laughed. Like, you, slow Justin, you made a track team? You not fast? We laughed at you because you did nothing in a hurry. And um, it was almost like you were too slow to even catch a cold. You had molasses, like, stuck to the bottom of your shoes. If we told you to empty the garbage, to clean your room, or... Whatever it was you were doing, you did it all in real slow motion. So when you said you joined the track team, that was a joke. That was, it sounds eerily familiar to Jace, right? Right. Very Jace moves so. just as slow as right. I did. We, we, we know it took you an hour to rake the leaves off the front yard. So we, we knew you didn't have any speed at raking leaves. But uh, I, I think your, your first meet was at Catholic High School when you was doing the hurdles. It and was. You came home. Yeah. Uh, we decided we'd come and see if you really was truly interested in, in running track. And you made the front page of the newspaper running the hurdles. Uh, so we knew there was some interest in track and field. Uh, How did that make you feel? Like watching your son at home, watching me home, moving slow, procrastinating, and then seeing this whole different person on the track when the gun went off. Like, well, I felt like, okay, this is really something. Obviously, he enjoys it and he wants to do it because that's the only thing it seems like it set fire under you to move. Well, as for me, I, I, I knew the, the, the little short gap between moving from New York to Pensacola and you taking up the interest in track again, running again. And all the accolades you got after you won the 300-meter hurdles, uh, I, I knew that you really was interested in track and field at that time. And made me feel real proud, you know. 
because all the people were running up to you, you know, giving you your accolades and stuff, and, you know. So I felt real good, and I, I could see your future in it. Okay. okay. It made me know that you're a kind person, because I remember you running the hurdles, and one of your teammates fell. I remember that, yeah. And what did you do? You turned around, you stopped, you helped them up, and then you went on to win the race. <laughs> which was amazing, which was absolutely amazing. Now you make me sound like a Hallmark commercial, but that, yeah, that's exactly what happened. i am put it on a card. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I felt bad for him. I mean, at that point in time, we were running on concrete, right? We was running on concrete, compressed gravel, and uh, old buddy took a bad spill. Yes. So I know he had road rash for real. So when he fell, I just, and he was my teammate, when he fell, I was like, man, you know, and he always looked up to me during races and like during practice and knowing that he was nervous before the race and then he fell. I was like, my heart just like, man, like I just want to pull him up, you know, and just help him get to the finish line. Give him some confidence. You know, he was inspired by me already, but I wanted to have some confidence for him. All right. Well, how did you feel? I felt, I felt I found what made me happy. I felt I f- track and field not only just running fast, but competing was a natural feeling for me. I loved it. I loved getting out there and running. Even if I wasn't the fastest, I was always testing myself. How can I be better? How can I be faster? So it always brought me joy. It it was never a moment in time where I got to a meet and I was like, I don't want to be here. I was excited for meets every day. If we had a meet every day, I was going to go to a meet. So I was excited for meets. Do you remember the article in the local newspaper and they had that big picture of you running and uh, headlines were born to run? I do. And we had T-shirts made with that. Yeah. The picture and the headlines born to run. That's that's the stuff that kind of threw me for a loop a little bit. Like I was never expecting or never my intent to like make the newspaper, you know, or be popular in that way. Um, what was it like seeing me on the front page of the sports newspaper for the first time, locally for the first time? A lot of joy, uh, a lot of real pride and joy in it. Uh, like I said, I saved the first newspaper clipping. I have it in the room, a trophy room, where you uh, made the you know, you know, front page newspaper at Catholic. Uh, you was running the hurdles at that time. Yeah. So we had to make our first decision. Jay Cormier, Coach Jay Cormier, RIP, bless his soul. Um, he came over to me to track me while I was at Washington, so running for Washington. He's coaching at Woodham. And um, he said to me, I think you should be on our team. <laughs> Just like that. Like, what? I think you should be on our team. You're almost beating our guy, and you're running the hurdles incorrectly. And he's like, give me an opportunity to come over here. And I remember going, coming home, and we sat. We talked about it, right? Yes. Um, ironically, we lived in Woodham District. But all my friends that I grew up with went to Washington at that point in time. What was your... Well, what, well the, how you ended up in Washington was an error on the school board. They sent us to Washington for you to go to high school. And even though you, we were in Woodham District, you actually lived closer to Washington. So wherever that cutoff line was, we don't know. But anyway, it was an error. And then when Coach Cormier realized that you were in Woodham District, he fought to get you transferred with your father to go over to Woodham High School. Well, it was a real fight because I didn't really want you to move out the district because I knew in the afternoon if you had to go to the library and do the research, you had your skateboard and you lived down the street from Washington, you could skateboard home in the evening time. But Coach Cormier was very adamant. He was really insistent on getting you to, to Woodham High School. So I would never answer the phone. And when I, one day I was home by myself, and he did call, and I answered the phone. He said, Mr. Gatlin says, uh, I know you've been ducking and you've been dodging me. You didn't want to talk to me because your son said you want to 
I wanted you to stay in Washington. I said, yeah, coach. Uh, and then I gave him the reasons why. But he said, let me say this to you. Washington is an upscale, upscale school. And I looked at your son's academic records. They don't have all our college bounds, uh, any classes that will give me college. college. Bound track. Mm -hmm. So um, I know you didn't know that. I said, no, I didn't know that. He said, well, look. If you allow me to uh, have your son transfer to War to Woodham High School, I'll ensure that he get his uh, counsel, guidance counsel for the next four years, and he'll be on a college-bound track. And, I mean, your son has really raw talent. I can see it in. I mean, I, I, I can get him a lot of gold C's. I can't promise him a scholarship, but he has a lot of raw talent, and we can build on that. Now, at Washington High School, there's only one coach and he coached the boys and the girls track team. Coach Whiteside, he really can't handle it. Um, but I, I admire Coach Whiteside because he came and told me, says, um, I remember him telling you that, uh, Justin, uh, you have a lot of talent, and I think you need to go to Woodham High School where they have about six coaches, and you'll be better off there, and you can unleash all your talent and show all your talent. Yeah. So I agreed with Coach. We went to the council. We went to... Uh, open school night, and we talked to the guidance council, and we talked to Coach Cormier, and and he was a man of his word. He he uh, he looked after you uh, for the next four years. Yeah, he did. He did. We we went into we transferred from Washington to Woodham. My soft after my sophomore year, so I spent my junior year and my senior year at Woodham. Um, were y'all nervous about the change? Were you, did you feel? I wasn't nervous about the change because after the big, long struggle with uh, the school district here with getting you to Woodham High School and them not wanting to acknowledge their error, uh, once you did get to Woodham High School, it was, it was great because the thing is, is that you got the attention that you needed. Cormier was a stand-up guy never, ever told us anything that he didn't stand up behind and back it up. So all, you know, props to him for that. But yeah, I was fine with it because um, the district already had made me angry, you know. <laughs> well, I, I, I look on this way. Your mom was your real tutor before, you know, uh, we had to take you uh, to see a psychologist. You know, and he they said that you had ADD, which is attention deficit disorder, and she would make sure you was on your meds, and she would make sure that you uh, prep yourself for the day's lesson on the way to school in the car. She would drop you off, and she'd have you do your your math tutoring and reading and all that stuff before she dropped you off, and uh, have you to take the bus from uh, where we live to to Woodham High School. It'd take you all around through the to the district, and it was about an hour ride, and I didn't know if you was going to be ready for school, prep for school in the morning, you know. And that's what uh, kind of upset me and made me angry, is you had to ride the bus when you, she was dropping you off. But it worked out. It really worked out for you. And it did. I mean, from a from an athletic standpoint, academic as well, we went on to my junior and my senior year at Woodham, and first year at Woodham, became state champion in the 110 hurdles and the 300 meter hurdles. Um, something that I don't think any of us were actually ready for. You know, we were all kind of thinking locally, like, ah, uh, I won districts, you know, and now I had these other athletes that I was competing against from Jacksonville and Gainesville. And now these are the things that we're doing. Um, what, was, what was that like for you? Well, you already had made a, a a name for yourself because the local meets here, you was winning all the local meets. I remember uh, at Tate High School, uh, the sponsor was Subway. Subway put on a meetup at Tate High School, and there was a lot of uh, fans, I mean, all the people in the audience that came to see you run. And after you ran, they got up and they left. Oh, you know? I, I do remember. I remember an older couple, and we were sitting watching the track meet, you know, and we started to talk and whatnot and everything. And the the woman said to me, she says, I just come to see 
that kid, that Justin Gatlin run. She said, I just love watching him run. Do you know him? And I said, yeah, I, I know him. That's my son. And we started <laughs> to laugh and talk. And, and the next thing I know with the other local track meets, there were other parents that were out there and people that were not parents because that particular couple was, could have been someone's grandparent at the time, but they just actually loved track and field and then zeroed in on you. And, well, and the, they were there to support you. And the crowd was really behind you. you know, they would always holler, turn on the juice, turn on the juice. You know, they never knew how that little mantra came along about the juice. Uh, I'll let your mom tell you, remember? Oh. <laughs> the kids used to tease you because after all the track beats, they're drinking sodas and and whatnot. No, no, no. Soda's bad for you. We still don't drink sodas. So you had to have juice. So then all the other kids start calling you juice, teasing you because you didn't drink sodas, but because you were so successful, then they wanted me to bring them juice. Uh, this is this is true. I remember this. We was we was, I think we were we were in a on a track trip, either going to Gainesville or Jacksonville. And this started from like Washington. Like the kids were drinking Fanta's and Cokes and Pepsi's on the ride. And I had <laughs> mom would make me the, the big thermos wow. and it'd be full of uh different juices and men and maid and all right. kinds like that. And they'd be like, what's in the thirds, man? I was like, it's juice. Well, mom made me juice. I was like, oh man, it's crazy. So they were like, all right, juice, man. That's what they always called me. <laughs> and then when I started running fast, they were like, juice, 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 juice. So yeah, that's where it came Turn from. Turn on the juice. Turn yeah. on the juice. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. We, we finished our, our first year at Woodham. And then we go into our second year, which is our senior year. And then we back it up, right? So we have a lot of traction, a lot of popularity. A lot of people are coming to see me run. Um, one thing that stood out in my mind was at State when I had to win the hurdles, right? And then go to the trophy, go to the podium, and then turn back around and run from the podium and get right back at the starting line to run the next race. Y'all remember that? Yes, right. I do, do remember. You, 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 you didn't even receive your medal. On the podium, you had to leave the podium to line up for your next event before they even passed out the medals. Yeah, I remember y'all in the stands like this: "Go, go, <laughs> go!" You because they miss were the calling race. your name for yeah. you to line up, and we didn't want you not to be there because otherwise you would have missed up the lineup, missed the lineup, and you would not have been able to be in in the track meet. Yeah, well, what that made event. it what made it really so exciting is that. The state championship hadn't been here in Pensacola in 30-some years, 32 years. And Coach Carmier, God rest his soul, uh, he took four athletes to Gainesville and brought back the state championship uh, with 52, uh, 52 and a half points. And I think 30 of those points was your points Yeah, to help bring back the state championship. Uh, and we won by half a point. But mm -hmm. it was the first time in 32 years that the championship was won from athletes from uh, Escambia County. Yeah. I, I would have got third place all on my own. Yep. At the state championship. Yeah. Um, it was cool because I think the year before my junior year, we had a busload full of athletes, studs from around, from around Pensacola. Right. And we didn't get the job done. We came runner up, second place. And I'm thinking that going into my senior year, we have. We only have, what, five of us, right? We had a right. discus thrower. We had another sprinter. We had a long jump. We had a high jumper. High jump, right. And we had me. So four athletes. Four, four athletes. athletes. Four athletes in total. Right. Four. And no relays, nothing. No distance running, nothing. And we went out there and we still won state. You know, that was, uh, for me, that was like, the that point in time, like the most electrifying, amazing feeling that, I had because I worked very hard for it leading up to it and then getting to state and winning by what, like a half a point. Right. Like right. to be able to do that. Like it was, it was amazing. Well, yeah, you, you all of your events, you meddled. All of your events, you meddled. You participated, if I'm not mistaken, in what, four or five events and every event that you participated in, you got the 10 points. Right. You mm -hmm. got the 10 points. So that's what, Push only, only you four guys over the top. The only one I didn't participate in was the high jump. 
Right. Only only because he didn't want to be tired for the other events. Right. So, which was, that's what Cormier was good at. Coach Cormier was good at delegating and seeing things from a- The bigger a, picture. The bigger picture of things. Instead of saying, hey, you're in this event, you should do the event, you know? Right. So he made a call and it still came out on top. Yeah. Yeah, I think the 300 was the 300 meters, was it the flat that you ran or the hurdles? 300 hurdles. Yeah. The hurdles. hurdles, you, I think, yeah, you, you accomplished that and that was it. I mean, that, <laughs> that put the icing on the cake. But I know you yeah. wanted to run the, the sprints. You died to run the sprints. And I remember Coach Cormier saying, sprint runners are a dime a dozen, but you cannot find a hurdler that can hurdle as fast as you were hurdling. And basically, that's what your scholarship for the University of Tennessee was yep. for a, as a hurdler. Most people don't even know you hurdled. And you were a sidewinder on top of that. Yeah. yeah that's what he calls you, the sidewinder. Because <laughs> you didn't have the technique to hurdle straight. You hurdled sideways. Yeah. I've had a very unorthodox uh, hurdling style. Um, well, let me take you back a little bit. I remember y'all went to the regionals in Tallahassee at FAM, um, mm-hmm. and you guys lost, but you went out and you congratulated all the other teams and the guys. Uh, you congratulated them, and that's what Coach Carmier said he saw in you as a real true athlete. You know, you was gracious in defeat, you know, and you went around and you shook hands with all the other ones that defeated you, you know. And he liked that about you. And he told me that. He says, I, I like that in your son. So you just got to let him come so we can work with him and make him a true athlete. You know. They gave you a balloon, didn't they, that said something about gracious in defeat and something in victory? I don't remember the I'm exact same. I vaguely remember that as well. Yeah. Um, but just, that was just me. I was right. like, it, it, I, never, I never was angry that I lost. Right. If anything, it always inspired me. I was like, whoever beat me, I'm trying to figure out how you beat me, why you beat me, and how I can be better. So all those times, I never was bummed out by losing. I always was like, oh, man, we just got to get back. We got to get back, work harder, and we'll see him down the road again. Well, that year, that's when uh, Coach Cormier came to us and told us that uh, – if Justin is really serious about track and field, you need to take him to Kissimmee to the Junior Olympics. And we drove you to Kissimmee and uh, let you fill out all the paperwork, all the entries for what you wanted to run. And I think you was running against some college, high school, and some college. Y'all were, y'all were upset with me because... I was you upset. You was upset with me. I was very upset. <laughs> you was upset with me because I registered myself out of my... Age bracket. Exactly. I raced, if I was 13, I was racing against 15 year olds. Right. But for me, I knew that I could beat the, 15, the 13 year olds. I needed a challenge. Well, I remember exactly what you told me because I was so upset. And you said, Ma, how can I get better if I don't challenge myself? I know I can beat all the kids in my age range. I need to challenge myself with running against these older kids. And that's what you did. Well, I think the last thing you said was to really truly find out if track and field is, is my niche. That's why I signed myself up to run against the 15 and 16 year olds and stuff. So it panned out. Uh, all the data that was put into the computers nationwide. And that's why Coach Comey started getting all the college calls for you to, you know, go to different colleges. But go see meets. Well, you were but, invited to North Carolina because of those stats. Right. Yeah. I mean, for, for na- high school nationals. Exactly. Right. From but that we high went, school We actually national. went twice. We went two years because <laughs> the first year we went, um, I went and did the, I want to say, was it the 110 hurdles then? Yeah. Yes. And I did the 110 hurdles and I did the 300 hurdles. Right. <laughs> well, actually, it wasn't 300 hurdles. It was a 400 hurdles because only the state of Florida was doing a 300 hurdles at that time. Yeah, right. And then y'all were like, y'all gonna, you really gonna run a 400 hurdles? You only do 300 hurdles. I was like, yeah, sign me up. I'm gonna do this. And then I get in the race. And wait, then- wait, before the race, though, <laughs> before you get in the race, 
you call Coach Cormier and no. you, 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 you're all excited about the fact that these are 400 and how am I going to run it and this and that. And Cormier says to you, just do your best. Don't worry about it. So you tell us you need some protein. Let's back it up a little bit. We got there after driving from Pensacola to North Carolina and got a ticket from the state trooper for you throwing trash out on the <laughs> side of the road. <laughs> but anyway, we, we, we got you there and we registered. And the guy that put on the meet, he came to you and told you, said, I know about your stats, young man. He says, uh, but these are not high school hurdles. These are college hurdles. And he brought one out and showed you how high, how it, was. high it was. Now, do you still want to run? You still? Justin said, well, I'm here. Let me call my coach. Yeah. And, and, and that's when Cormier told you, do the best you can. You said you needed some protein. I said, well, do you want to practice? The hotel we stayed in had a pool, you know, to run, you know, swim, get some laps in and build yourself up or whatnot. No, all you wanted was some steak and eggs from the pancake house. And that was your protein. That was my tradition. I carried that whole tradition all the way through college. Every every time we went on the trip, I ate steak and eggs no matter where we went. But back to the story of me running my first 400, 400 meter hurdle race. Um, let's just say that the race got good. You know, it took off. I was in contention. By the time we hit that 300 meter mark, that with that 100 meters to go, I feel like I hit a wall. And I just started running backwards. And um, <laughs> I remember coming across the line and just going straight to the infield and just laying there on you my back. You laid there was... so long. You <laughs> laid there so long. It scared me to death. I, I kept saying to your father, go get him. Go get him. What's wrong with him? Is he dead? <laughs> Only thing I could hear was your voice from, from the stands. Justin, Justin, you okay? And all That's... I could do was just throw up my hand like. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It scared me to death. But. Even with all of that, you still came in as third place. Yeah. You yeah. still came in as third place, which was remarkable. Yeah. It was unheard of that you, this little high school kid, came into this big college meet and stuff like that, but they running the 400 hurdles for the first time, and you took third place. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we go, we'll go ahead a little bit. So. We finished up through high school, high school nationals. Um, second year, my last year, senior year of high school nationals. That's when they allowed me to run the 100 meters. I begged the meat promoter because he knew me as a hurdler. I begged the meat promoter and said, hey, like, allow me to run the 100 meters. No one ever thought I was going to be as good as I did. I finished third um, behind some really good names. And yeah, some pros. Yeah, Dwight. Remember Dwight Thomas? Bigger. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Bigger, bigger was on a roll then. He, he ran like 10-1 as a high schooler, you know? Right. So that's when Vince saw me. In the, he was in the stands. He already was already talking to me. But then he saw me again, and he saw that I could run the sprints, like for real. And he said, man, you would have did better if you didn't rock back in the blocks. So I remember as we started our collegiate campaign and these colleges came over, what did that make y'all feel like when we started having like colleges send us mail and then people come knocking on the door? Were y'all surprised? And LSU showing us their display of rings that if you that let was, him come to us. That was Arkansas. That was Arkansas? Yeah, yeah I went Arkansas. to LSU. I went oh, on a okay. trip to LSU. Right. Okay. Yeah. Arkansas. And he had this ring box and he opens up this, this box with all of these championship rings in it. You know, you let him come to us, he's going to get one of these rings or whatever. LSU was the one that had the Jaguar. Yeah. They, they took you Coach, yeah. to, on a go-see and rode you around in the Jaguar. Yeah. Jaguar, five-star hotel. Yeah. Uh, lunch at the uh, Coach's uh, Lake House. Well, uh, my intention was to ensure that you got a good education. That's one of the reasons why when I got transferred in Fort Hamilton in New York to, to the South, I didn't want to... Uh, I didn't know much about the school system over in Alabama, and your mom didn't want to live in Alabama. So with your uncle and your aunt both in school, uh, school uh, teachers and stuff, so we decided to enroll you here. And I got accommodations here in Pensacola and drove 56 miles one way every day for five years to make sure you got a good education. Uh, I wanted you to go to college. That was my dream for you to go to college. 
But after you did so well with the tutelage of Coach Cormier and you got a four-year scholarship for your full ride, I mean, you got about 30 letters from uh, Brown University in New York where John F. Kennedy's son went. And I guess you got about 10 from LSU and, of course, then... Uh, South Carolina. You, South Carolina. Right. University, right. University of Florida, That's Miami. Right. Well, you were dying to Everywhere. go to LSU because you like Bourbon Street because we went there for a timeshare once and you want to hang out on Bourbon Street. But uh, we're going for well, as college was concerned, I told you, you can't go down to LSU because you want to hang out down in, in the quarters. No, you need to go find another school because I'm out there going down there. <laughs> if your grades fall, I'm going to have to bring you, bring you from down to Tell LSU. Tell it like you said it. He said, if you go down there and you mess up, he was going to beat you all the way back to Pensacola. He did. He said that. <laughs> he definitely well, said that. <laughs> he said he's going to beat you all the way back. Well, lo and behold, uh, you got the go see to the Vols, the Orange. Tennessee. Tennessee. All right. Right. And Coach uh, met you and picked you up and, and – uh, Come to find out that uh, he and his wife both were was uh, athletes, and when you came back home, uh, you was overjoyed, and you said you're going to sign it at Tennessee. And your reason was that you knew that you wasn't going to get overlooked, and uh, there was no racism there because he had a black wife and he was a white coach, and you felt comfortable going to the University of Tennessee. And he was going to be looked after by Vince Anderson. And we got to speak and meet him. And it turned out uh, very well for you. Very well for you. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, I enjoyed the visit. It was definitely a, a night and day situation from taking a trip to LSU, which rolled out the red carpet compared to Tennessee. Um, but it was, it was a talk with, with Vince that really sealed the deal, Vince, Vince Anderson. And he really just was passionate. And he reminded me so much of Cormier right. when he spoke. Right. And some of the things were eerily similar. He was like, look, I can't tell you you're going to win a championship with us, but I can make you the best athlete you want to be. And that's my job. Right. And when he said that, I was like, sign me up. For whatever reason, I was like, sign me up. Even all those other teams... They already had championships like Arkansas. LSU had a loaded team. It was just like, and Tennessee wasn't even on the radar for even win a championship. Right. They had a, You're the right. last championship they won was over a decade ago. So I just wanted to get something and, and build something there. And I think I was with the right coach and that's what we did. So, so Vince, Vince have, even after leaving Tennessee, Vince has been a very good mentor to you and a very good friend to us. We had conversations just like he mentored you, even though you were no longer a Tennessee athlete, but professional. Vince was a good guy. I can honestly say that between Coach Cormier and Vince Anderson, they were two of the best. They were two of the best, not because of their training, but because of who Cormier was and who Vince is. Exactly, right. exactly. Um, well, uh, not to cut you off, but uh, uh, Clinton must have sent you about 15, 16 letters. They want you to come to Clinton and run with Sean Crawford, you know. But I was afraid that Sean was... Too much for you. Right, just a real powerful guy, and you wouldn't get any really time in the spotlight there, so... We felt, we, felt the right same, we felt the same way about Leonard, Leonard Scott over at Tennessee. Didn't know much, too much about Leonard Scott. He was, it was, he was a quiet weapon they had there, but you showed him you was, <laughs> you was more. Well, fine. Leonard Scott was, was top dog at Tennessee. Yeah. He was football and, and track and field. Yeah. He was the man. Yeah. Um, and I think that created a problem for him once you came. Well, I mean, I think at the end of the day, do, playing dual sports like that always is going to create a chink in your armor somewhere because, you know, you're splitting your efforts and your focus between two sports and you're trying to make both two of them events, a priority. Right. Exactly. 
So I felt like when he was doing spring ball, that's when I can do my real fall training, you know, and just keep my fall training going into spring. So by the time we always get to nationals, he would always be injured or his body retired because he didn't have that base training he needed during the springtime. Um, and that's why I flourished. And that's why we went first year at Tennessee. Excuse me, first year at Tennessee. And um, we get to Oregon Nationals. And we did the, at that point in time, the unthinkable, the impossible. We win the 100 meters as a freshman and we win the 200 meters as a freshman, which wasn't done for over 30 years by Harvey Glance. Right. So what was that like for y'all? Like watching me go from this high school kid and winning and losing along the way and then winning the NCAA title and running away with both championships and the national championship for teams. It took a while for it to set in for me, uh, to be very, very honest. It could not sound crazy, but I always look for you to get beat. <laughs> I did because I don't know if that was my mechanism to say, well, I won't be so upset or I won't be that sad or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was like kind of playing it all down. You know, he gets beat. It's OK. It's OK. You know, we're here for him. We, you know, that was our whole reason for being at the track meets to let you know. If there's no one else here for you, your mom and your daddy's here. Absolutely. You're going to be okay. Yeah. You know, but every time you would win. And wow. I would say, damn. So it was, like a delight, it was like a delight for you. It's like, oh, okay, we yeah, won another one. Exactly, oh, okay, we exactly, won another one. Exactly, <laughs> All right, okay. Well, exactly. my, my chest, I had to uh, uh, buy my shirts a little bigger because my chest was pumped up, but I didn't want to let that go to your head, you know. But I knew there was a lot more. And I would always tell you to dig deep, dig, man, just dig. He would and say that course, every time you run. You could hear that, right? And, yeah. And dig. I'm, and of course. He would, be, he would be dig, dig, dig. And you'd be, oh, Lord. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you're right. Oh, you're, Lord. You're right. I'd be praying and he'd be digging. <laughs> wow. Ren Ronaldo said, I ain't sitting next to her. <laughs> we, we, we knew that only, uh, it, it only lasted two years because you, you know, you became, uh, I guess, the Cinderella uh, of the sport, you know, you, you give good two years to University of Tennessee and everybody's, uh, all the shoe sponsors start digging at you and stuff. So we had to sit back and kind of uh, put up some guardrails to protect you and stuff, you know, after your two years at Tennessee. So um, after my first year of Tennessee, we on a roll. Everyone's super excited. Coaches are happy. We're all happy. Um, Vince says, before you leave for the summer, let's go run a, a, a USA track and field junior race, right? So we sign up, you know, and I think for a long time, Vince has held this over his head and his heart. And he felt like a lot of it was his fault at the time. Correct. Um, we didn't declare that I was taking Adderall. Now, mind you, we all know that I was diagnosed in second grade. and Basically, I was an 80s, 90s baby. So around that time, we were the kids that were experimented on. So we took Zoloft, we took Ritalin, and we took Adderall. But it had been a part of my education and my life from second grade all the way up to that point right. in college, right? So, so he doesn't write down and declare Adderall. I take the test, P test, and then... Maybe like a month later, comes back, tests positive, right? Can you, as parents, explain how, does that, how did that feel when you saw that letter or when you got that news? Well, I remember getting it in the mailbox, and I opened it. And for whatever reason, I really didn't understand it. I, you know, we didn't know about the testing pool. We didn't know that there was some kind of sanctions or whatever that went along with anything if there was a failed test. We did not know anything about a failed test and what it meant. And I really think that what happened is that, and this is why you were truly born to run, because track is the 
only thing, the only thing that you seem to have been able to focus on, to focus and not have an issue with thinking about it, focusing on it. You did it automatically with track. I think Anderson saw you on the track. He did not, it didn't sink into his head every time he saw you that this kid is on Adderall academically because mm-hmm. he could not focus in the classroom. Yeah. But when it came to the track, you focused. You didn't need anything. So you really were able to excel naturally. That's your God-given talent. And I think when we got that information and that news, we didn't know anything about it. We were kind of like, what the, what's this? I what remember, is this? I remember us being confused. I remember you asking me a question like, well, do you know anything about this? I was like, I don't know what this is either. So I think that we had to get on the phone and talk to Vince about it. And that's when we found out, you know, um, I tested positive and it's kind of hazy to me exactly how the process went, but I know that they served me two years. I know that we, I know that it was minute traces of amphetamines, which is found in Adderall. Right. Right. And, um, I remember them dealing the two years and then after dealing the two years, which really didn't affect me because from you were a collegiate from, athlete. I was a collegiate athlete and I was getting tested collegially all the time. So I didn't even think anything of it either. Right. Right. Well, what? I, I, uh, I, I felt bad. I mean, it hurt me. I, I helped uh, Vince a little uh, responsible for it. Uh, then of course, I, I, I kind of think that Vince Anderson was a little ADDHD himself because I mean, you look for him one place over here. Next time you see him over here, he was like a a, a, a a caged cat. You know, he was just moving and stuff. He had all the hyperactivity in him. So I I, I, I can see him filling out the paperwork and just skipping over, over stuff real quick and not check that box for you. You know, it, it hurt. It hurt. Well, it was just weird because, and I think the biggest thing was a failed drug test. Well, we know you don't use drugs. What are you talking about? Yeah. And the fact that it was medication that you had taken all of your school life academically to be focused, um, it never dawned on us to say, this is a drug and he's going to fail a test. We right, had no right. clue. Yeah. Had no clue. None whatsoever. Right. I think that what really, even though, like you said, I was still able to run collegially, I think what really hurt later on when you look at 2020 hindsight is that Adderall wasn't even on their list. Correct. Exactly. Right. Adderall was never Correct. even on their ban list. Correct. So how are you supposed to know what chemically makes up a medication? Well, see, that's if you can't even reference it correctly, you know, see, that's one of the things that has always bothered me. How can you hold someone responsible for something Forget the fact that they say ignorance is no excuse, but it wasn't about being ignorant. It was not listed. It was not right. listed as a banned substance. And then a month later, it was. It, a month right. after they suspended you. It mysteriously put, came on the list. Exactly. It was listed. Yeah, yeah. Because exactly. That was our argument. So they're going to clean it up. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we got to the computer. I sit down and we wrote a nice long letter to the arms and buzzman. And we was telling them, you know, hey, we, we checked the, the list. It's not even on the list. So how can you hold him responsible for taking a medication that he uses in the classroom to help him focus? You know, they had all of the documentation from your doctor. For the years that you had been diagnosed and for the years that you had taken the medication. And even though what you were taking at the time was not on the list. Nobody cared. It's like, oh, we got, we, we got a druggie. And so, that's the way I took it. Yeah. I, I think once we moved past it, because the saving grace in the situation was that collegially I still could run. Exactly. Right. Now, mind you, um, they did a whole expose on me going into the next year nationals, my sophomore year nationals. Um, and it definitely... It made me 
embarrassed, you know, to be able right. to be amongst right. my peers and to deal with something that I never even knew about. I felt right. alienated in a way, you know? Right. And um, at the end of it, we still prevailed. Yes. We came out on top. We came back. We won the 100. We won the 200. We won indoor nationals. LSU slighted us on the, um, <laughs> and they know it because we talk about it to this day. Right. With other LSU athletes. Right. We, they slighted us on the relay. Which, if they got disqualified, we would have won nationals and again. And they should have been disqualified. Exactly. But they wanted to, we were at LSU. So there you go. So, what did that make you feel going from knowing that we had a suspension, we were served for two years, still able to go out to NCAAs and still win in this fashion that we were winning before? Did, did that make you feel proud, um, justified? To me, it hurt, but, but I knew it went, you know. The two years, with, when she served the two years, you still had the energy and the juice in you. You know, you still had the desire to be an athlete, a true top athlete, you know, and I was there for you. Even though I, uh, I couldn't do anything to the powers to be, which I wanted to, but, you know, uh, I was there with you to serve the two years and get you back out there, you know. Yeah. But you still, like you said, could uh, run as a collegiate athlete. And you did everything you could do uh, at Tennessee. And that's when the shoe companies Stop started jumping courting, ahead. You know. <laughs> Stop jumping ahead. But my feeling is, is that what God has for you, no man can take it away. Absolutely. No man can take it away. And they tried. They tried damn hard. Mm -hmm. They tried. Yeah. So... Through all of that, I say we were victorious. Absolutely. And moved on. So we, we finished our collegiate campaign um, only in two years, win six NCAA championships. Right. Um, we go from being on top of the mountain. Now it's time for us to declare and transition to turn pro but the only way we could do that is because i still had a whole year of being banned and then we would seriously get a a letter in the mail which to this day i've never heard any any uh, anti-doping agency ever doing this sending a letter in the mail saying we're, we're, we're gonna revoke that extra year so now you can go pro so what? What you gonna say? What's they your face? They revoked that because they knew they were wrong. I, I they knew it. they they did not admit to their wrongness without because of the medication Wasn't not on being the on the list. Right, right. But they solved their problem. Right, by, by bringing you back. By bringing you back. So that was their form of being justified, and at the same time, they're gonna claim they were being lenient, but they knew. It was not on the list. Gotcha. I agree. Um, so now we declare we go pro. How do y'all feel about that? How do y'all feel about making the decision to go pro? Especially in my sophomore year. You had to. And the reason why I say you had to is because, well, the thing is, is that as far as staying a collegiate athlete, there was nothing for you to gain. There was absolutely nothing for you to gain. You had done Everything plus as a collegiate athlete, two more years as a collegiate athlete was not going to give you anything. Um, yes, you needed to stay in school. Yes, you needed to finish and get your degree, but not as a collegiate athlete because there was nothing for you to achieve. You had already done it all twice. Yeah. True, right. So with that being said, you you was happy. You was you was cool with the the decision of going pro. Going pro, yes, of course. Um, I mean that was the ultimate goal to see you on top. You know, as one of the top athletes in the U.S. and around the world. I mean, you know, uh, it was going to give you open the door for you to run at the Olympics and and World Games and around the world. You know, but. Uh, I don't know. We, uh, I never thought of it as 
oh, the Olympics. None of that ever crossed my mind, to be very honest. I didn't say, oh, now he's going to be pro, so he's going to get a chance or he's going to go to the Olympics. Like I said, my whole thing was if you're growing and achieving, you cannot grow and achieve anymore at Tennessee. So you have to take the next step, whatever the next step would bring. You had to take the next step. It wasn't in Tennessee. You know what? Every day I, I think about my career and I think about us taking this journey through my career and how neither one of you had any real track background. Like none. 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 And we were, just, we were just holding hands, walking through this path together like, okay, we're going to turn pro. We didn't even know what tur- turning pro even meant. Didn't know, you know anything I mean? we didn't about. Know nothing about it, but we were just trying to make the most sound decisions possible. Yeah, but we just knew to ask questions and to guard you. Uh, to not let anybody take advantage of you. And we were going to do that together. You know? Yeah. But uh, it's when she got the call, we were headed to New York to, to a funeral and her family. Uh, we had just come back from vacation. That's what it was. We had just come back from vacation and we were in the car and you got a call from a coach. I don't know if, we should name him or not, but you yeah, got We do. We named him before. Okay. We got, we got, a, we we got, got a, call a call from, from this guy named Trevor Graham, yep. coach. And, he's, and he, you're in the back seat of the car. And at that time, you know, cell phones, you were paying by the minute. You know, every, every mm-hmm. minute you talk or whatever. And all I could hear you saying, no, nah, no, nah, that's, not, that's not who this is. No, nah, no. Nah. And I said, you boy, stop burning up my damn minutes. Which <laughs> Either you talking or either you're not talking. Who is this? And we were in the back on our way to New York to my aunt's funeral. And that's when you said, this is Trevor Graham and he is Marion's coach. And I remember saying to Trevor Graham, we on our way to the funeral. You call me when we get back. I remember. I remember. Yeah. Um, I I think that that showed me how fast the track world moved. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. You know, I mean, we didn't know the next step. We know we declared, we know that uh, we were getting um, look, look at from Nike and Adidas, but this was like the first time we had, a call from a real bona fide coach. Right. But it also showed our uh, I lack say of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. I don't want to say ignorance, but lack, lack of, knowledge, of knowledge. Lack of knowledge in our sport because, you know, at that point in time, coaches like that, if you compare them to any other sport, they would have been well known. You know, everyone right. would have known them. Everyone would know right. what they look like. We did not know nothing. The only thing that was shining about that is he said he was Marion Jones' coach. Everybody at that time knew who Marion Jones she was. She was a household name. Exactly. Right. She was the next best thing since says, sliced bread. And then right. he said, and I'm calling for Nike. Well, everybody know who Nike is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that was it. You know, Marion Jones' coach and Nike. I, I mean, f- what more information do you need? <laughs> I felt like when we made that transition and then once he, once he called back and he vetted and we vetted him. Um, I think that I still felt like y'all were nervous about me moving as a young adult to a whole place by myself in North Carolina. Most definitely. Okay. Right. Most definitely. Um, basically, you were over 18, but you were not 21. So you were still a minor. There were things legally that you were unable to sign and do. You know, um, when you say Vet it, Trevor. Um, I I beg to differ. Well, I mean, we didn't vet him as in like we knew knowledge to look him up. We only right. could talk to, you know, Nike, whoever else, right? Who were who were already backing him? You know, Nike that was backing him. Nike, yeah. he was calling exactly. on behalf of yeah. Nike to bring you into the professional circle and as your coach. Yeah, exactly. You so know, that's what I meant by right. that's what I meant okay. by vetting. Okay. I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that, of course, we know better now and we knew better after. But after the fact doesn't really help. But th- we did learn that, yes, you do need to vet people. At, for us, the only thing we knew, once again, Nike, 
and Marion Jones. That was good enough for us. Yeah. That was good enough. What did we know? We didn't know track and field. We didn't. Well, we, we, we got to, uh, to meet Trevor and his, his wife. Um, and he, he, he gave us a lot of background of him and his wife and who she was and what he was trying to do. And he had a stable full of good athletes and stuff like that. And he wanted to include you in it. And, and I felt kind of secure because I found out that uh, what one athlete did, every athlete did. If y'all go to the movies, one athlete go to the movie, all athletes went to the movie. He kept y'all together as a team and stuff, and he looked after y'all, you know, which I felt kind of comfortable, uh, you know, giving you over to him because he told me I'm going to treat your son just like he's my son, you know, and I'm going to look after him. So uh, I, I felt kind of content. You going to to knock a lot of the run with Trevor Graham, you know, well, at that time. Trevor was a good help at that time because actually Trevor steered us to where you needed to live, which was a good area, a clean place. And Trevor steered us to the different things in North Carolina even to the furniture factories, because you lived in a dorm. You didn't have anything. So we had to get there, find a, a decent place for you to live, and at the same time, furnish your apartment. So Trevor was instrumental in guiding us in the direction we needed to go to get those things done. I mean, yeah, he, he, he definitely held up his end of the agreement when it came to Protecting me as right. in the sense of getting me acclimated, I was an investment in a way as well. Yes, right. you know? definitely. But he was also that person there that I only knew uh, as I got to know the other athletes. You know, he made sure that I felt comfortable. I felt acclimated and I was a part of the, the training group and felt ready to go. I mean, yeah. so we go on to 2003, well, our first professional race. Right. He got 60 you ready meters, for that. Right. Got us ready. Right. Um, I raced against one of my idols, our first race out, which was Maurice Green. Right. And you beat him. You and remember Madison that race? And beat him. In, in, in Madison Square, Square in Garden. In Madison Square Garden and right. beat him. And, and we beat him and we beat him. Um, what did that, you didn't did, get first place. I didn't get first. You got second place. I got second. And Terrence Jamel was hot. He was, he was on fire then. Yes. Right. He was exactly. Running, he was running extremely well. Exactly. Right. And, right. and, 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 and Maurice came in third. Yeah. So Maurice it's first, second, and third. Yeah. Right. So every time you went up against Maurice, you beat Maurice. But the thing is, is that I think you felt bad about it only because Maurice was so kind to you when you were in Tennessee and y'all went to Penn Relay. I didn't feel bad about it. I just, it's just like, it, it's weird when it's somebody you grow up and you look to emulate. Right. And now your, uh, your idols become your rivals. That's what they say, mm. right? right? So mm. when that happens, like the gun goes off, my intent was still to win, to win, you know. Right. And then I won, right? I didn't want to be overjoyed. I'm like, yeah, yeah. It was the fact that I was very happy. Um, y'all was sitting in the stands in Madison Square Garden. How did y'all? What did that feel like watching my first professional race? I was very elated. I mean, really. Uh... <laughs> I think everybody was jumping up in front of me. I couldn't see, but I knew you, you know, you came in and you, you know, you, you did what you had to do. And I was very proud of you. I, yeah. I really was. It was but. so funny because Nike provided us with tickets to the race. And being that it was in Madison Square Garden and it was your home where you were born and all of my family was there in New York. Every time I turned around, we were trying to get more tickets. We ended up ended up with about 15 tickets that Nike got us for my family to come and see you run your first race. And I remember when the race was over with, somebody tapped me on my shoulder and said, great job, and gave a thumbs up. It was, I believe, Tim Phelan. He mm -hmm. and, and, and Cap were sitting in back of us. And you didn't even know. And No, we didn't know. He and, and Tim, and I said, oh, wow, they're sitting here and 
They're happy. They're happy. They're proud. Well, you know, for the people that's going to be watching, we got to give a little substance. So Tim Phelan and John Capriati are the heads of We're Nike heads Worldwide of, Track at, and Field. At right, that time. Right. They're the exactly. ones who sign the contracts. They're the ones who, you know, make sure you get your checks. Exactly. You know? But um, I think... I think it's a good place where we're going to stop right now because we got a lot more to talk about. Um, that was a good lead up all the way from where we started to where we at now. It's just going to get even more exciting. And I want everybody to stay tuned. Ready, set, go. We'll be back. <laughs>